Welcome to the Don't Call It Small Business Podcast, powered by Foreman and Associates, LLC, a consulting and professional development services firm. I'm your host, Natasha Foreman. Our podcast provides professionals and organizational leaders with helpful advice, tips, and business news that you can use for training, development, strategic realignment, and more. We examine the tough questions and issues impacting our businesses, households, and communities. If you like what you hear and find the content useful, please share us with your inner circle. Now that we've covered that and you've learned a little about us and why we do what we do, let's get to work. Join us for today's episode. Last week, we talked about doing business um, with family. (laughs) Uh, Of course, we're going to continue that. Um, for uh, and span that over a few different episodes because that's a biggie. That's a hot spot right there. Um, but I wanted to focus on um, workplace inconsistencies. And so there is a quote from Ty Howard that says, inconsistent people often follow their poor performance or inaction with excuses of why they fail to do what they were supposed to do consistently well. And I've had a few people bring this issue to me and I said we dedicate at least one episode to it. It's so broad and can cover so many avenues. And oftentimes when we discuss workplace inconsistencies, the legal eagles and the HR folks, you know, they zoom in on policies and employee handbooks. And of course, all those issues we'll cover in today's episode. Um, And then there's the inconsistency of getting the work done at the time, quality, attention, expected Um, for the intended purpose. So I want to share two people's examples. These are just two people that have come to me. Um, Person one, they were trained to do certain tasks using, you know, specific software to follow steps A to Z a a specific way to contact managers using certain tools based on specific protocols. So like maybe email or instant message or through an app. However, Once they were put into the field to start getting their feet wet with clients, the employee is now getting chastised and browbeat by a specific supervisor, not even their direct supervisor, it's another supervisor, um, but it's one that they end up having contact with a couple of times a week. And so this supervisor is browbeating them for not knowing certain things, not doing other things a certain way. Now, mind you, this is the employee's, um, this this example right here I'm giving you is the employee's first day in the field. They aren't expected to know everything. And maybe just maybe in training, not every possible scenario and what if, um, you know, like what if this never gonna happen situation occurs is taught to the employees. I want you guys to think about something. Our military forces go through boot camp or some type of training and it's for however many weeks or month or months and then they're put into the field now they're not expected to know everything there is to know when they're now going to field they're going to be learning in real time and they'll be taught and redirected and coached and mentored in real time so you would expect a more seasoned military professional to get the the basics, but you're not expecting the newbie to get it. And so you're, they're not going to be attacked (laughs) verbally, whatever, um, for not necessarily getting something that hadn't been covered because they didn't cover, Oh, what happens if this happens? Well, no, that wasn't covered. We covered the basics. And so with that, that is the mindset that should be the mindset that should be the, the core um, training of when you are bringing anyone new into an into an arena into um, an environment and they're being taught whether it's the software they're being taught your processes those first several months um, are really dedicated on the continual training it's not that a person is trained and then oh they are now ready they're not a robot and even robots need tweaking So it's not that, oh, you went through training. Well, you should know it all. You should be able to do this. No, they're people, we're not wired. I need you to really wrap your minds around this. And I'm speaking to so many people because I hear it so often, 
not just from the people that have come to me, but it's also, you know, students. It's, it's just from the conversations. It's from seeing the social media posts. Some of you just don't get it. And maybe you don't get it because you haven't been trained to, to get it. Maybe you're just talking out the side of your necks, as we used to say in the 70s, because you don't get it. So this is some, this scenario right here is one that I am, it's just kind of like it rose to the surface of priorities to discuss because what you end up doing is you end up creating a mixed message in this person's head and you, you now plant the seed of doubt. You plant the seed of that this person can't do what they need to do. Now we'll deal with the jerk, excuse me, supervisor's unacceptable behavior later, later, um, if, but you know, if I hear one more story of an employee being demeaned and, um, ridiculed, har- harshly chastised, even cussed out, I might forget that children are present and just go off on someone. I mean, it's no one's fault that you lack emotional intelligence and self-control. If you can't articulate your disappointment in a way that doesn't leave the other person feeling like smashed bug guts, then you need to take a break and walk away. Just shut up for all of our sake. Okay, dang it. I said we'd talk about the buttheads later. So let's get to today's pressing topic. Let's get back to person number one. So the supervisor missed the memo that this is person number one's first day, or they saw the memo and just didn't care. Either way, they're both off to a bad start, but it gets worse. As the days progress, the supervisor is now writing the employees back about protocols that the employee has written in their notes. And there's a contradiction between what this supervisor says and the employee notes. So the employee gets to, they go to their direct supervisor, of course, right? And so they're sharing this, <laughs> these horrid experiences, but they're also asking for clarification. The supervisor confirms what's in the employee's notes, but also adds to the steps um, and, you know, the what ifs and what can be done, which only further confuses the employee because why is the second supervisor saying that what the employee fresh out of training with training notes is saying they've been trained to do, but in the most recent training that took months to complete is now wrong. So I've just finished training and this is what we've been taught in training. And you're saying that what we've been taught in training is wrong, but you're not the trainer. You aren't the curriculum developer. You aren't even in the training, but this is what the second supervisor has said. So we won't discuss in detail in this episode, the behavior of that second supervisor when the employee's direct supervisor Um, actually came to them and they had said something about how the second supervisor was mistreating the employee and how it was interesting. Um, They said the second supervisor had taken it upon themselves to retaliate now against the employee. So strategically, it's clear the supervisor is trying to set that employee up for some harsh punishment, right? And that could be a write-up, transfer, termination. It, you know, we won't delve into that insanity today we'll address that nonsense in an upcoming episode but I want to make sure I put a pin in it so that when I you know go back listen and go back and look at my notes I remember we have to make sure we follow up with that behavior because it's this is not something that's just isolated to this incident we see this all over the place so let's pivot to person number two um someone in an entirely different state organization and industry person number two has a manager who is some tiny Sometimes they show up to work on their scheduled days and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they follow store and company policies and procedures and rules and sometimes they make up their own. The manager is inconsistent with training, managing and leading. So this manager has spent time getting staff certified to be trainers, but then doesn't ensure that uh, the certified trainers are assigned to a shift to assist workers. And then there's a group uh, or there's this, this growing list of workers who have been waiting months for the manager to put in their purple paperwork for various supervisory positions. Now, this is after the manager fast-tracked the process uh, for a few others a while back. So you're like, okay, so when are we proceeding with ours? For some people, the manager gives 
detailed feedback, right? And then for others, just a little. And then for others, none. So there's a lot of layers to this example. I will say this about both examples, example one and example two. All three of the managers, supervisors, whatever title you you want to give them or they want to answer to, they all need major training on management and leadership and communication. In the first example, those sessions are to be teachable moments. The supervisors to walk the employee through the steps and stages, ensuring that they're taking those detailed notes because you took notes in training, but you need to take notes in this training too because the training does not stop. Training never stops. Our learning does not stop, right? So you have that. And making sure they have those notes so that the the employee can now quickly refer back to them when needed, when that supervisor's not around or when they're on their lunch break or, and hopefully you're not doing it on your lunch break, but I know that some of us like to, right? We're really trying to do our best. But when you have those down moments and you want to go back and look through your notes, what the supervisor also failed to do, if let's see if you picked up on this, was to quickly identify that there were inconsistencies and either they needed to pause and confer with a colleague or higher up or pause and ascertain the best steps and tell the employee the steps the supervisor has been taking and then tell them to follow those steps for this particular client call. And then together they would double back to address the inconsistency, giving the supervisor time to quickly confer with the coworker or higher up, right? So then while the employee is continuing to do the client, working on the client's case, that's what the supervisor can do. Or as long as the step that was taught to the new employee in in their their initial training was not that huge of a deviation and wouldn't trigger a negative domino effect, why wouldn't the supervisor just proceed with that step and then tell them that you'll confirm the correct steps moving forward, right? Because what do you, I mean, like, You know this, this is what the the, you break down. The new trainees get new and updated information sometimes before seasoned workers are trained on the updates. We know this, right? We've seen this happen. So this can cause inconsistency when companies do this. You can cause a a ripple that can become a tidal wave. So retrain, uptrain, in-train, whatever. Get your established workers trained on the new ways, new info, new devices, software, hardware, whatever, before you bring fresh meat on the team who is doing and saying something slightly, mostly, or entirely different. Now, this is how you can cause discord, disharmony, dis-ease within your teams and your organizations, right? If if you create an, an environment where you have this conflicting information you now are, it's almost like you're pitting two sides against each other and the newbies have no clue. They're new. They just want to j- join in and be accepted and be part of something and do something great. Um, so, and then you have your established workers that are feeling affronted. So even if you're rolling out the changes in phases, I really strongly recommend that you let everyone know and see what the changes will be and when they can expect to see the changes, receive training, etc. So this is another approach, right? Um, that way, if you, um, you're you hiring people and they'll be clumped in as new trainees on the, you know, and they're going to be utilizing the new way, no one will look at them like they're morons when they aren't doing and saying things like the old way, which for many of your workers will be the current way. And as we've discussed in previous episodes, no one likes change and we rarely do it voluntarily. There's usually some resistance and pushback. So with that, those are some approaches to how you can go about um, doing that so that you don't create the inconsistency. You don't create the confusion and the chaos that we see now in example one, where you have an established worker who's like, no, that's not the way we do it. Okay, but this new worker has been trained on this new way. So versus telling them that they're wrong, you need to find a way to either have them focus on that or you need to be able to position them in a way where you can create a scenario that will make sure the job gets done while you can confirm right or wrong. That's what you need to be able to do. And so many of us fail in that way. And it's a disservice to our teams when we do that. 
So I want to focus on supervisor two because I know that um, we need to really zoom in on the the elements that make this person up because I don't think that a lot of people really focus on those elements and what that means. Um, their training needs are focused on that what they really need to focus on is conflict resolution, de-escalation, how to address issues and how to advocate for a team member. So we have the, we have the supervisor who is the antagonist and we have the sec the, the direct supervisor that this employee is, you know, answering to, um, they need to understand how to handle these things, conflict resolution, de-escalation, how to address issues and how to advocate for a team member. So the moment they found out that the other supervisor was retaliating and continued to do so, they needed to address it. The thing is, is that the employee had already told their supervisor, please, whatever you do, just don't say anything to the other supervisor because I don't want to take the flack for it. I don't want to be punished for it. And the other supervisor was like, oh no, it'll be fine. Okay, well, once you found out it wasn't fine, when this employee comes back to you and says, okay, now I'm taking heat for it. I'm taking flack for this after I said I felt I would. What are you going to do? The employee's direct supervisor should have addressed this with the other supervisor, notifying them that they were in violation of company policy, state and federal laws, and that it'd be reported to HR and anyone else who had the authority and autonomy to discipline the supervisor. By not advocating and standing up for the employee, this too is inconsistent with what is outlined in the employee handbook because you know that it's in the employee handbook, especially at an agency that I'm referring to. I It's in the employee handbook. So if it's now in contradiction to, it's inconsistent with what is outlined in the handbook, what's covered in training, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The supervisor unknowingly enabled a bully who probably has an unwritten history of bullying, intimidation, retaliation. They may have a written history of it. So what about the second example with the store manager who wants to play Casper the Friendly Ghost on some days? Remember the second example? Whole nother industry, it's, it's, it's a store, um, I call it a store. It's, it's not a grocery store. It's not a clothing store. But, um, well, I'm going to focus on that. So I will tell you the same thing that I told the employee when they came to me for a mentoring session. Their manager is no longer to be their go-to for role modeling in the company. Because you can't, if you role model Casper, the friendly ghost, you're going to be Casper, right? I assumed, and I still assume that the manager was and is going through some personal issues. Um, it can also be, uh, double dipping, right? Work in a second job. And we see people do this. They work a second job they, and then they schedule themselves at their main job. So at the store, so they get paid even though they're not coming in. Well, I don't know if that's really what's happening, but whether this employee and their coworkers realize it or not, um, they were learning bad behavior and habits and practices that if they haven't repeated it, they're going to repeat. And if it's left unchecked, um, and then that would become their behavior and those habits and practices would soon repeat and become adopted. And that would then become their character, right? That inconsistency, that lack of care, lack of concern. So other managers, what I have found out through the conversation, they had told this employee to they needed to just go around, their, go around, go above their store manager for guidance and help. And also for the promotion that the manager kept finding reasons not to give. And so, of course, in my you know mentoring session, I was trying to find out, well, what feedback have you been getting? You know, is there any evaluations that you received? And it was like none. It was. And so I'm like, well, how do you then know how well you're performing or how well you're doing um, socially and in other ways, like, you know, this is a customer facing position, but it's also a team based position. And so there was inconsistencies in that. So it is something that it, there's so many different layers. I'm like, oh my goodness, a major case study, <laughs> but sometimes, and oftentimes people don't want 
you to outshine them or rise above them. So they try to keep you underfoot. And that could be a possibility with example number two as well. Um, So sometimes people don't know the answers. So rather than admit it, they give you misinformation or they get upset with you for asking the question or upset at you for putting them in a predicament to be found out as a person without all the answers, which by the way, you didn't put them in any predicament situation or hot seat. They walked right in and sat down. It's, and I, and I'm, this is something I just have to stress. It's, and I, and I have to stress this. This is easy folks. I want you to say it with me and I'm going to say it slow. I'm not quite sure, but let me check and get back to you. Or I don't know, let me find out and double back to you. Or, wow, that's a good question. When I have an answer, I'll let you know. Or, I don't know, but so-and-so probably does. Go ask them. Now, in both of the examples that I've shared today, the employees were sharing information that led me to quickly surmise that these managers were also suffering from big head syndrome. Now, the thing is, is that with the I don't know, a lot of people don't want to say I don't know because to them that makes them think as though, oh, they're incompetent, whatever. No, it is high competence to admit you don't know, but I'll try to find the answers or I'll point you in the right direction or you know who may know. That right there, that gives people surety and it builds trust. Because they know, okay, there's not possible this person is Encyclopedia Britannica of all things, always, all things. No. So it's great. You build great confidence and trust when people know that you may not know, but you're trying to help them to find an answer. Boom. Like, there you go. So what I've seen in the two examples that I've shared is you have at least two managers. The third manager is more passive, right? So what I in the first example, we have the two managers um, the direct manager is, I think, a little bit more passive and probably that um, second, that other supervisor who has now been retaliating, they probably have a more aggressive uh, energy in a way. And so the direct supervisor is trying to um, placate into and is taking more of a passive position because they don't want to deal with the conflict. Um, but the the aggressor in example one and Casper the friendly ghost in example two, um, in some ways both suffer from big head syndrome. And that's where they think that their title has made them immune from having to extend, you know, common courtesy or, <laughs> or treat lower ranking um, employees with some dignity and respect. And, and, um, and I, we see this a lot, right? And we've talked about this in previous episodes. That title has as much worth as the name badge or desk plate or wall plate or whatever door mount um, that is printed on, especially if your raggedy butt gets fired. Like you being a, the VP of whatever means nothing if you're fired. Um, and it means nothing when you leave work that day. Is It means like, it's just so irritating. So let's quickly also address some other workplace no-nos. And I'm going to quickly, I'm going to grab this list really quick because I want to make sure that I stay focused. Um, but here we go. So um, some other workplace no-nos where inconsistency can rear its ugly head and bite a huge chunk out of you and you know where. Now um, is one, if your company doesn't have an employee handbook. Now I've mentioned it, right? But some of you may say, ooh, um, and if that employee handbook doesn't have outline policies and guidelines and rules that you are reviewing and updating one or two times a year, then you better get to getting and draft it up to reduce your liabilities. And the reason why I said one or two times a year is because if you start making major changes in your organization at least twice in a year, then most likely there may be something that is going to be impacted by or that will impact your employee handbook and you need to confirm. You may need to update. You may need to add something to it or adjust something, Um, especially those of you that are jumping on the DEI bandwagon and now, you know, you want to pioneer this change and be this force. And I'm not, and I I hate to be so cynical, but there are a lot of people that are just checking boxes, right? Um, And so with that, what does your employee handbook say? Um, What's the guiding force? What does your business plan say? (laughs) 
<laughs> how, you know, when you have that all tied into it. So however often you, you review your business plan, however often you review your strategic plan, you need to make sure that there's also time set aside where HR and management goes over those employee handbooks so that um, you can make sure that not only are you reducing your liabilities, but you're establishing good faith. Um, and that good faith is to help establish the rights and responsibilities in that workplace. Once again, you're building trust and confidence. Um, so a second thing is that you've got these policies, but are you enforcing them? So whether they're written or unwritten, um, you better make sure that you're doing so with consistency. So I don't care if it's attendance or dress code, awards, bonuses, promotions, raises. It's, um, it's better to have it in writing, of course, and, but it's best that it's followed and enforced consistently. This isn't tic-tac-toe, but so many people are playing tic-tac-toe and you're opening yourself up for a lawsuit. You're opening yourself up for, um, you know, to be on the front pages of somebody's newspaper, to be a trend um, and in the wrong way on social media. <laughs> You're going to be hashtag your company or hashtag your name, right? Um, and then a third thing is when we don't focus on purging dormant and outdated policies. Um, it used to, you know, you, you look, oh, it used to be relevant and make sense. Um, it was needed, but it's, you know, no longer that can actually, once again, invite some litigation because if you have a manager that decides to enforce a policy years after it had died off and nobody else had been enforcing it. And now this manager does that can set be a setup for a discrimination case because it could be said that that manager, um, zeroed in targeted in on one particular person. So you um, have to, of course, make sure that you're not actually dealing with outdated perceptions of a policy that would actually be useful if it were uniformly followed. So I want to stress that as well, because sometimes it's just our perceptions um, puts a slant on things. That's why reviewing the employee handbook and monitoring how policies are applied throughout the organization, especially when it comes to disciplining employees can help HR and other managers get a better handle on which policies to keep and which to toss. That now tees me up to the fourth thing. Um, if you said HR who, then that's an issue. If you don't have someone in-house or outsource is handling or consulting you and your team, and I'm speaking to the decision makers and paycheck signers right now, if you haven't invested in an HR service provider, then you are the biggest problem, period. <laughs> the buck stops with you. So it starts and stops with you. So you need to make sure that you get the assistance that you need to support you, your team, and your business as is needed. Um, because the closer you get to that mission and vision that you've been running towards, the only way possible is that the entire organization has to come together. It can't come in segments, right? So... If you're inconsistent in managing your business, it will be inconsistent in holding up his end of that bargain, of the relationship. Your return on your investment is your return on your investment. What are you investing in time, energy, talent, whatever? Whatever you're putting in, you're going to get out. And that's something that um, I want to say that leads me to this mindset that if we have inconsistent training, inconsistent quality control, inconsistent management, inconsistent billing, just keep going down the list. You are literally unraveling the dream, the vision, uh, your business. You are literally killing the energy that makes your business operate. Your business will die. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, there's four things that we ask of you. First, please leave a rating and review. Second, be sure to connect with us on social media. Third, head over to foremanllc.com slash podcast to sign up to our email list. And fourth, check out all the links and resources in the show notes. Thank you for tuning in to the Don't Call It Small Business Podcast, for sharing these episodes with others and for your continued support. And don't forget what we tell you on every episode. Don't call what you're planning, thinking, dreaming, or doing, little or small. Go big, go bold, or go nowhere. We can't wait to reconnect with you soon. 
See you next time.